Bonjour, welcome to another edition of Café de René. I am the third wheel today, James Dunstall, joined once again by the Star Show, Mr. René Dupree. René, who are you brought today? I met a ver uh, very, very special guest that I first met 20 years ago. Uh, I met him uh, at a house show in my hometown backstage. It was the first time I met him. And then about a month later, we reconnected when I did my uh, WWE tryout in Cincinnati. He is uh, a man with the right to censor. He'll show you, you'll see. He is big dancing Stevie Cool Richards. Did I get all your gimmicks? Uh, yeah, no, I guess <laughs> that just proves I'm a moving target throughout 30 years, just trying never get, never get fired. Right? So, uh, yeah, exactly. So it's a uh, it's a pleasure to be here, man. I'm sorry that it uh, took a while for us to connect, and I, I'm kind of like the Bill Murray of pro wrestling right now, where I'm kind of hard to pin down. But um, also, you left out you left out the. Um, the main event of the dark matches in the December to dismember pay-per-view that ended 18 minutes early when we put in, uh, I think a 17 minute match. <laughs> Cause remember that? Well, did we go 17? We want a good, I mean, we want a good 14, 15. I think we did a good, oh, we, did, we put some time in. Okay. Yeah. I actually Look, wish that, I that could go back. I wish I stole the match from catering, the, the VHS tape. <laughs> it, was really, it really was one of my favorite matches, and I thought we would uh, we would end up doing something, but it was not to be. Well, you know how it goes. But, uh, yeah, that was uh, December to December. Yeah, we were the dark match on that uh, classic, classic pay-per-view. And uh, But, man, I haven't seen you in forever. How you been? Oh, everything is great, man. Uh, life after pro wrestling and a new chapter and all that stuff over the past few years has been, you know, not easy. You know what it's like, Renee, after, after WWE in a full-time wrestling career, you try to find where your niche is and what, what's next for you. But when you kind of find out where your lane is and what you enjoy, uh, it's, it's really a blessing. It's cool. I mean, you never work harder than you do as a pro wrestler on the road. And it sets you up for a very, very, uh, you know, it seems to be a very rare work ethic that most people don't have. Right? 100%, man. 100%. How are you doing? I know you're supposed to ask me the questions, but how are you doing? <laughs> well, I'm finally uh, headed back on the road after two years of uh, going crazy here. Um, I leave next Wednesday. I'm taking back off to Tokyo. Uh, Russell, oh, wow. Russell. That's awesome. Are you going on one of those... Uh, one of those uh, culture shock three week tours that the, the kids oh. usually crack everybody. <laughs> Brother, I'm going over there for four months. Wow. Oh, yeah. man. Yeah. Well, shit, I've been going over there like once I left WWE, right? Um, I was booked over there uh, literally a day after I asked for my release. And it's been 15 years, man. Constantly going over, man. I love it. Oh, good for you, man. That's awesome. And they, they Americanized their style quite a bit since like last time I checked when we were both with the company, it's become more of an American style, right? Well, there's so many different companies, right. That like, um, they all have a different type of style. Like Noah's is very shoot based, really hard hitting, you know, but I, I really enjoy it. You know, in New Japan, that's what most Westerners probably follow the most. Yeah, they, I agree. They, they've become a little bit more Americanized as far as... Now, when you said pro wrestling, no and shoot style, I, I would like to re-announce my retirement from professional wrestling. <laughs> uh, I just want to wanna put that out there right now. If I just do podcasts where I announce my retirement that's based on Noah's style, I think I'll be good. Right. No, one thing about Stevie, I love wrestling with Stevie because you know you weren't going to get hurt. That's one thing about him, you know, very safe worker. And uh, yeah, it was always, I think we, we wrestled a, a bunch more on the ECW brand, right? We did. We did. Actually, I think our, our first real on camera thing was a fun one. By the way, I want to introduce myself to your host here. I'm Stevie. How are you? <laughs> I say, we massive fan. You don't need to introduce yourself. Thank you. Well, I do. Here. You know, we're all, you know, 
we're all having a conversation. So if you want to step in, ask questions or give your input on anything, you're more than welcome to. You don't have to feel I'll, like I'll have my turn during the show. Renee would be like, right, James, you got anything to ask? And I'll just ask the little Matt questions. Okay. I was going to say, you don't have to feel like Renee and I did in a WWE locker room. You can feel pretty comfortable. <laughs> like, <laughs> we don't See, this like is the right. concept I have, Steve. It's like, uh, when I talk with the guests, it's like two two of the boys talking about, and then he he has the the fan you know fan questions basically that all the fans want to know. So it's a little you know something a little different that we do, right? Cool. Now whatever you guys want to do, but here's the you probably do remember this, but you were one of uh, you were one of the roster um, I guess uh, additions or the stars that the GM of Stevie Knight Heat recruited to be on Heat. And remember, I ran to the ring like a maniac and kissed you both like you the French thing on the cheeks and then just ran off into the sunset. Dude, I remember I remember you telling me this story. Like, you had dubbed yourself the G, a GM of, of, of Stevie Knight Heat, right? And then didn't Stephanie come up to you one time and said, when, have, when did you become the GM of Stevie of Sunday Night Heat? It's, it's like, actually one of the, it's one of uh, my favorite things that ever happened in my career that people don't know about. Cause like urban legend, like you said, I heard that you didn't, they didn't even know we, you know, it used to be when you were on Sunday night heat, everybody treated it like it was a chore. They would go out there with some people would have boo-boo faces on when they would go out and have a Sunday night heat match. Mm -hmm. So I, I knew that I needed, since I was always on heat, I needed to do something different. So why not act like I actually wanted to be there and act like I thought I bought the show to act like I was the GM act like coach and Al were my employees. And we even did angles where I would get mad at people like gold dust for being insubordinate employees to me on, on Stevie night heat. The, the, the thing that people don't know is that the production people coach Al snow, the guys like spike and, and you know, you and uh, Sylvan and everybody was in on the supposed rib that it was underground. We were producing the show and vignettes, backstage promos, making matches. They weren't even having matches. We would just, and if they made the match, we would make an angle, do a promo or some kind of angle off it, yeah. and they would run with it. And then Coach and Al would secretly get these production guys to get in on it. They would throw the pre-tapes up. We would have all this stuff that Stephanie, Johnny Ace, Vince, Anybody in power, JR, when he was there at the time, nobody knew this was going on until seven months into <laughs> it. Seven months. I'm not even, I'm not, you know, wrestlers lie and all that stuff. I'm not even, if I, I might be eight months, I might be understating it. Wow. And the, the way they found out was, by the way, I'm walking around with tights that say Stevie Knight Heat on them <laughs> with, the, with the Heat logo. Richie and Magic is making a Stevie Knight Heat championship based on the winged <laughs> eagle belt. I'm making wow. a belt where I will defend it and Spike will just beat me for it right off the bat on, on Stevie Night Heat. But we were in, this is when Coach and Al were doing the, the commentator angle against Lawler and JR and they won the right to commentate Raw. Yeah. So we were, Victoria and myself were afraid. We didn't have a lot of money with, with Heat. So we actually baked them pies. And I had a chef hat on and an apron that said, kiss the GM. Victoria had store-bought supermarket pies, but we were telling them we baked them ourselves. And this is when Johnny Ace walked in and thought it was great. He kind of knew. Stephanie walked in and said, Johnny, when did Stevie become the GM of Heat? And he goes, oh, Stephanie, I had no idea about any of it. No, Stevie, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> you know? Yeah, pure, John, the, the, the pure Johnny Ace. Yeah. Right on their bus, which I loved actually for that situation. And then they came back to me after they stopped and took me off TV. Two months later, Stephanie goes, we have a great idea. We're going to make you the GM of Sunday Night Heat. And we're going to call it Stevie Night Heat. And I said, you know what? That's a great idea. And <laughs> <laughs> maybe fight <laughs> just in case you came up with this idea like i was so sarcastic and she thought i was like just being so grateful right but that sounds about accurate for for the environment right Renee? <laughs> that dude you hit the nail on the head so for the fans who wonder what it's like he just that to a t that's yeah <laughs> it's it's Dang. funny it's so you just have to laugh at it you have to roll with it 
And then, you know, someday you'll be on a podcast 10, 15 years from now and everybody will be laughing about it. It's all good. It's all, yeah. I've always found you a creative person, Stevie, because I listened to your show with Russo and when you review Raw Smackdown stuff. And I've uh, one episode I remember particularly is when you was reviewing one of the uh, Raw reunion shows. And obviously creative from WWE is at an all-time low, but I remember you saying something about the right two cents and you didn't pre-plan this. You just thought of it off the top of your head. And I'm like, wow, he's just booked a whole night about right to censor and like legends trying to stop him off the top of his, of his head. I'm like, this guy should be in creative. Well, and I appreciate that. Thank you. But when you're in the system and then more specifically, Brene knows the bubble, uh, you don't quite think straight. Your mind is all twisted. You, you are walking on eggshells. And quite frankly, the writers that they hired, I, you know, in the days when we were wrestling, we, I, we were both, I think, in the era when it went from a booker to the writing team, which to having a booker is a lot easier to deal with than that because there's one person's vision, being Vince or Pat or Vince and Pat, but the smaller the crew, the more focused the vision for the entire company. When too many chefs are in the, the kitchen. And I think that's by design now, too, because those 10 writers are 27 or whatever. They're a buffer. So you can't get the Vince or you can't get to Johnny Ace. These are the these are these people are paid to take the bullets for them. And then it, it gets lost in these little sleeper cells and these other things. And that's what I think it is. Bureaucracy is the reason why there's no real creative being done there right now. So when you're somebody in like, somebody who actually somebody who's actually a real producer or agent would have cursed Vince out in Gorilla after he took that shitty stunner. Come on, we all, <laughs> you know what I mean? To say that, oh, yeah. that to say that <laughs> nobody, I mean, either 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 it was standing applause, which is that you have to do to keep your job, or Gorilla was evacuated in a ghost town and nobody was there. When he right. got back. God, oh, right. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. This is great, great conversation, man. So, so I remember like you being in the locker and I always liked being around you because you were, you were smart to the business of it. Like, I remember having a conversation with you about the, 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 the pay and how you said, Randy, this is how it works. There's a set, there's a set uh, amount of money per year that is okay. This is for the talent. And you said like, okay, you just got the top, there's like different rows of people like okay this is the top guy they get like say maybe like 55 percent and then the mid carters will get x amount of percent and then you know the guys who are working heat and you know you know you know what i mean they would get the rest i remember you pointing that out to me so i learned so much from you like the business aspect so i always want to thank you for that because you smart me well, up to that right well thank you i appreciate yeah. that i i think the way i i remember i said i learned a lot about the way they worked at Johnny Ace, for some reason, did take a liking to me. And I was able, I was like, I was always willing to go to OVW and do house shows and get guys ready for TV and be the first match. And we flew, um, I think it was when we did, um, I believe it was uh, Singapore, Singapore, Bangkok, Perth, Australia, then back to Phoenix, all within four to five days. Like we were in a different country every day, but we did the flight from the US to Tokyo, I think. And Johnny was sitting next to me and we got to know each other and he was explaining, cause I was kind of frustrated. I didn't understand the way it worked. And he was quite honest with me that I came in, there was a standard $75,000 a year, you know, guaranteed when the guarantees came in, yeah. but then it became, if you were a $75,000 a year guy, then you usually stayed around there. You got like up to a hundred or 105, maybe 124. I don't know why these numbers we're always consistent with that, but they gave you a little bit over that. So you couldn't really bitch, but they always kept you at a level of heat or something where they fed you for a good match with like Jericho once in a while or somebody, mm -hmm. but you never could break that ceiling. But if you came in and I think this is the way I explained it to you, Renee, if you came in as a $200,000 a year guy, you were definitely almost going to be near that IC title thing. If you were three to 400 or 500, you were always going to be in the mix for the IC or the tag, but you also had a chance to maybe break up and, and work with the actual champion. doesn't mean you would ever break through there, but that's why Johnny sort of explained it to me 
And he goes, you just have to make yourself completely unfireable and we can't release you because you're doing all these different things. And that's what I did from that point on. Yeah. So it's, I mean, you know, you had a hell of a run there, man. You were there a good decade, right? Yeah. Well, almost 10 years. So wow. not, not straight on TV when I, that's the one thing I regret. Like it was like a lot of stop and start type stuff. But when I had the, the stop, I was always working. I was in OVW. I was working house shows. What a, what a big teeth did to get him ready. I remember to run with him like in the South through Texas, Oklahoma, Louisiana to yeah. get him right before TV. And then when I got called up, it would be Chris Masters. It would be Orton. It would be a whole a host of people. You know, I, yeah. I, I, I regret sometimes that I didn't have more of a hand with other guys or get the work seen in the early days or get the work. It, you know, anybody that debuted to be their kind of first angle. But yeah, I did, man. I was blessed to be there for almost 10 years and to have people remember me, you know, like you said, so many gimmicks, but I poured my heart and soul and didn't necessarily listen to the, to the, to the limited creative that was around me. You know what I mean? Like, like the right to censor was only a three to four week deal, but then the one it? of the right. Yeah, that's all it was supposed to be. It was, it was essentially some, in some ways, a rib to cut my hair, you know, which you can believe, right? But Dude, was, didn't, didn't, yeah, 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 yeah. It was because of, uh, it was because of the son-in-law, right? Like Test, Christian, yourself, a bunch of guys were forced to cut their hair, right? Val? I, I think I had the best, the best spot to get the hair cut, or at least the biggest reason, because those guys were all still in the same kind of persona, my whole right. thing was going from the long haired kid yeah. to, to being this, this, this conservative cult leader. Now the, right, conservative, right. the conservative part was the rib on the parent television council and Bozell and all those people. But because of a writer that I got very, uh, very close with his friends who I'm still friends with today, Jamie, one of the, one of the writers, okay. he said, you know what, this should be a cult thing. And he pitched it to Vince and then, all these gimmicks like Val and Godfather and other people that could, that couldn't really continue to do what they were doing, at least for the time being temporarily could be placed in this gimmick, which just meant for me more traction. So that, that was good. The Dr. Stevie thing, people still remember that. And of course the ECW BWO stuff it, to have at least one thing people remember is an incredible blessing. And I'm grateful to have three to four things and sometimes five to six, dude, that, that blows me away that somebody, right. you know, then the most wrestlers say, Oh, if I get recognized, I'm going to act like I don't have time. I don't think I've ever been that person where someone's given me five seconds at our time that I don't try to give them more back. Kind of like you in the locker room. I know what it's like, dude, because I was there for 10 years and from 1999 to 2008, there's never one day that I felt comfortable in that locker room. So it was my mission First of all, you know, most times I dress with the extras because I never felt comfortable with, with most of the main talent. And then when I ran across guys like you and other guys that were brand new at the time, I knew the Bubba's and the other people were going to be kind of rough on you, if not straight out rough. So I think it was my job to say, hey, man, first of all, we're not, we're not all like this. And second of all, the business isn't supposed to be like this. Not at this level. You're not supposed to be tested. We're all right. supposed to be stars we paid our dues why are why are we doing this so not to go off on a tangent but i i fully have tried to not try to make the business a less toxic and intimidating place for the people that are in the locker room i mean outside of that you got to prove yourself but yes if somebody's hired you why are, why are you continue to be tested that's just doesn't make sense right. to me right yeah i always felt like it was you, you you're never not tested you're constantly being tested, right? Well, you and I, you, yeah, but you're, you're disciplined. You work out hard. You keep your body in shape. You're working. Dude, there's nobody else to be more critical of ourselves or test ourselves more than ourselves. So why, 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 why the dog and pony show bullshit? Why do it? Well, would you agree with me? Like uh, maybe, you know, there's a lot of competition and jealousy in our industry, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe it's a mind fuck to try to, you know, screw with this guy to screw him up in the head. And then, okay. Then he'll, you know what I mean? I don't yeah. Know, but in that. the spirit of true competition, if you can't be better than me, then you're just not better than me. 
if you have to play those other games, then that's, that's, that skews your own, to me, that skews your own confidence and legacy. Right. When, right, when it's right. known that you do that, but that's, but that's wrestling. They're still doing it today. That's it, man. That's if it. everybody, if, every, if you, if you and I could really fight to that level, we would have went to UFC fought once every six months and made millions right. of dollars. Right. Exactly. Yeah. James, you got anything, bud? Yeah. Um, speaking of politics and like toxic uh, behind the scenes, I'm going to have to ask you about your infamous chair shot on JBL because you've done something I think many wrestlers, Renee included, would love to do, <laughs> bash a chair over JBL's head. Um, obviously, it happened the night before, well, was it a couple of days before One Night Stand where he took liberties with Mane? Yeah? How did that come about when, as an apology to Mane, he was able to like chair shot JBL? How did that all come about? Well, I, I think it was a June was no one night stand, and I think this was July or August. So there was some time right. between the thing that happened, you know, at one night stand between those two guys, and then you know the the match when Beanie got signed, BWO came back for a short time. Which, would, honestly, if you don't see that they were trying to avoid a lawsuit and hired Beanie oh, for yeah. two months, and then kind of you can calm all that down with them getting in the ring to see that, like, okay where there's no looks there's no like to stand on what a lawsuit after that so i'm not wwe did the smart thing uh honestly if i were meanie i would have sued and you know i would not have taken the bait on the deal because it was it wasn't what we're all about now i will say that i'm not proud of the fact that even though people always come up and say that was something that should have happened i wasn't proud and renee said it perfectly earlier when you're in the ring with me you knew you weren't going to get hurt so there's a level of trust so there's a little bit of a trust that was lost for a little bit, not heat. Well, I didn't have heat, but guys didn't trust me because I was always known and they never said it, but I knew it. And I wouldn't trust somebody that looked like they took liberties like that, which I did not. It was to, seriously, the conversation that happened was I didn't feel comfortable with the terror shot to begin with because John is much taller than me. And unless he leans all the way down or he's on his knees, which I kind of pitched, like, dude, if you're on your knees, I can get a clear shot with the with the seat of the chair. Yeah. So no, no, just lay into me. It's cool. It's, it'll be fine. And the way Brene knows how I overthink stuff fundamentally and, and the way I place everything very, very like analytically, I was like, I'm going to try to reach it. And that's what I did. I tried to reach as far as I can with the shot and the bar still hit him on top of the head. And dude, he had a, he had a hole in his head. Wow. It, was not, it was not something that, you know, people can judge it on the outside, whatever way they want. And I know the way John was, and he was pretty rough with me too for a, for a while, for months and months. He, he and the APA and even the locker room uh, hazed me quite a bit. And in the ring, there was liberties taken, but that still doesn't mean that I should have done it and I did not do it. And as a matter of fact, uh, um, John called after that and said we should make this into an angle so okay. he made the website he made the website interview me and me say it was received he was in on it uh, however you know who wasn't in on it undertaker who came oh. up to me next tv <laughs> he was going to come up to me and confront me and he saw john first and to his credit, he should have. If I did, you actually went to the website and said you did it on purpose and hurt one of our talents when at the time they had a thin roster with lots of injuries, lots of people out. So it was his me in the locker room later. He was going to, like, I don't think anything physical was going to happen. He was going to read me the ride act. John stopped him and said, uh, hey, no, <laughs> I told him to do it. So that would have been maybe an interesting story that I would not have enjoyed telling <laughs> of Taker. <laughs> But he still, he even pulled me aside afterwards, right afterwards. And I said, Taker, I swear to God, I didn't mean to do it. And he goes, you have to understand, we have a lot of injuries right now. Now we're down another guy. You got to be careful. He was not intimidating or belligerent or, or trying to scare me. He was just trying to tell me sternly, like, hey, man, this, you don't do that. And I knew right away. I knew right away that, like, I was unfortunately right about the 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 schematics of the chair shot that he's just so john doesn't you might not think he's that big because there's a lot of guys that are super big in the company but he's a big dude he's a minimum six five six six and i'm oh, yeah. six two 
So you can imagine how much reach just to get them so I don't hit them in the face. Mm. And that's what ended up happening. Speaking of injuries, man, I remember you were working with Chris Masters and you gave it, was it the Polish hammer? Well, I don't, I don't remember working with him. <laughs> <laughs> it's Chris Masters. No, man, did, did, did that completely, it completely yeah. broke your nose into the side, right? That was a I, brutal injury. I, my nose from, he swung this way, my nose was under this eye. Whoa! Literally, God. and all these teeth needed a root canal and some veneers and stuff like that. It was the horrible bone got broke. It was literally as hard as someone could hit me because he, he was aiming for my chest. And okay. obviously the two things happened. Number one, he had food poisoning, which I didn't know, or I would have, I would have been acting a little bit different in the ring and not so aggressive with him in the right. ring. Number two, and Renee's been there. He was being talked up so much into a frenzy about this is your only shot. This is your, this is, if you fuck this up, this is it. Arn Anderson, like to hit Stevie as hard as he can, he can take it. Doesn't matter. And I'm like, saying, yeah, it kind of matters. <laughs> <laughs> but um, Arn, you know, it, the one thing I'll say, it, it, you know, and I don't mean, I don't think he meant any malevolent thing by it, but like once again in the bubble and Arn can, he never denied it, but he never actually admitted it either. When Chris was literally crying after, because like Renee said, it was an ugly scene. There was blood everywhere. It was, my face was just a bloody mess. Um, and I remember Aaron going up, trying to console him right in front of me and said, hey man, don't worry about it. It's only Stevie. What? I lost, I swear. And I lost a great deal of respect for him that day. And I don't, I forgive him because I know he didn't mean it, but I'll never forget it. And, and Renee Renee's Renee's surprised reaction with everything he's seen and heard the wrestling business never ceases to surprise you. So Jesus. I don't, I hold nothing against him, but I think his way of consoling Chris was just uh, the words weren't exactly, I, I think they could have been chosen a lot better because that's, that's the problem with wrestling too, is your value as a human being is determined by your push or your lack of push. And I think that's the way the statement was kind of put to Chris. Yeah. I don't hold it against him. I never really had it. I never really had two words with Arn except he gave me the finish after that. And I said, thank you. It was a very quiet, you know, for me not to talk to somebody every day or for me not to interact with them or be friendly, yeah. just very business. Thank you, sir. That's it. Oh, cool. One word answers. But he, I don't think he ever got the, the, the impression that I was like truly bothered by that that statement the first time i ever said this by the way on a show you wow. know so exclusive. exclusive damn dude so you yeah that... we're out the clip if you want <laughs> <laughs> if Aaron called if Aaron called me and he said first of all i have no recollection of that i would number one i, I, I honestly believe him because he's seen and he's had right. to deal with so much you know yeah. it's all a blur and he wouldn't even need to apologize but i'm sure being arm being the guy he would would call and apologize. I would accept it and say, Hey man, sorry. I haven't had to even tell the story, but it, yeah. it's the truth. Oh, fuck, man. That's so okay. Dude, we're here now. It's, it's not a big deal. My nose isn't under my eye anymore. <laughs> my, right. teeth my mouth. Next time oh, I'm knocking, that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> I remember, I remember, uh, well, with Arn, I remember, uh, I was in there with Booker. It was right before we we're flying out for the tribute to the troops, and I was. It was me and Kenzo against Booker and Eddie, and Booker had gave me a back elbow, just completely shattered my nose, man. I was out. I was out for the rest of the match. And wow. I mean, Arn was cool, you know, but Booker was very apologetic. You know, he didn't mean to do it. You know, and, and this I is before the tour. Over. Huh? You had to fly after getting hit like this. Oh yeah, we had to fly to uh to fucking Iraq or Afghanistan. Yeah, that's what I mean. You had to fly over there with a broken nose. Broken nose, concussion. Guess, get this. It was my 21st birthday. <laughs> I do, re I do so, remember that, actually. I do remember that. Were you there with us? On that, no, I didn't go to that? Iraq. Okay, yeah, okay. Thank, thank God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was quite the experience, dude. That, let me tell you. Do you, but, do you, know, uh, you know, speaking of which, do you know that you, you, you hung around Rob Van Dam? So you know the story about 
volunteering for Iraq with Vince. Oh, yeah, yeah. He said, uh, have a nice trip. <laughs> no, yeah. what he said, he said, um, Johnny came up, hey, just letting you know, Rob, the, the thing is completely voluntary. He said, cool, I'm not going. Right. Uh, <laughs> oh, it's not voluntary. And he's like, no, I'm not going. And then Vince came up and said hmm. something to the effect of, hey, it's it's completely a voluntary trip. You don't have to go. And he said, all right, man, I'm not going to go. He goes, it's completely voluntary. Right. All right, cool. Right. You go. I'm not going. Remember, Rob wouldn't sell for it. <laughs> right. so he didn't give a shit. Yeah. I think he said, yeah. like, uh, I, I heard Rob talking about it. Like, Vince was trying to talk him up, like, you'll love this experience. You know, it's going to be something you'll never forget. And he was right about that because I never forgot about it. Christ <laughs> almighty. I got food poisoning over there, dude. So broken nose, concussion, 21st birthday. I get because we went to the chow hall, you know, like the cafeteria for the for the military men and stuff. And I, you know, the you can relate. We eat clean. We try to eat clean. And I so I'm looking at the fucking menu and I said, okay, I'll do no carb, just some beef patties, you know. Bad idea. Because whatever spices they use, dude. We were there for like two or three days. I did not stop fucking shitting the whole time. <laughs> Brutal. Oh, you're pretty lean after all that. You couldn't eat. You couldn't breathe. You couldn't drink. <laughs> you know? I didn't sleep too. We're in a fucking yeah. war zone, man. You could have got your photos like from the neck down, and then you could have just when you felt more rested, photoshopped in the face. Right. Right. <laughs> oh Christ, James, you got any questions? Oh, I've got like millions of questions, Stevie. <laughs> Go ahead, man. Go ahead. Uh, um, I was telling Renee, obviously, uh, I miss ACW first time round because we didn't really get that much over here in the UK. You have to get the videotapes. I'm aging myself now. Um, but I've been watching a lot of it on the network, and what I've loved I've, is the angle with Raven and when they brought in Bueller and that whole Tommy Dreamer angle. And my favorite part is when you and Bueller's in the ring. And uh, you're saying, you know, give me a kiss. She's like, no, no, no. And then she announces she's pregnant. I think Joey Styles' face sells it to me because he's like, whoa. Mm -hmm. And then Raven comes into the ring. He's like, do you read it? It's one, one pill a day more. On. <laughs> and then she's like, it's not you, yours. And then he goes and beat you up. How fun was it having this whole angle? It was a lot of fun. It, the whole thing, and I think Renee can, can um, speak on this too, when you're in the company and when you're in the moment and you're in the angle and stuff, you know, it's fun. And you know, you guys are doing some stuff, but you truly don't know that it's going to stand the test of time. And people are going to talk about it 10 or 20 when you're in the moment and then you got to do the next show. Mm -hmm. So you can't quite rest on those laurels anyway. So, and we were out two or three times a show. So when we were at the arena, there was three weeks of TV, but we would come out the same night three times for, different things so to have the crowd still react and still be in and that's raven raven to be able to craft a story and and for everybody that says about scotty and you know how hard he can be sometimes to deal with because he's a genius and because he does see and i knew that early when i used to kind of like as a kid not get the full scope of the angle and the psychology he's the guy that way i mean dreamer would help paul would help but it was like 99.9% .9 Raven. And the reason why Renee says being smart about the business means smart about smart about things that happen in the ring with psychology, 100% Raven. I owe my career to that guy. What well, was um, the other shots in the WCW? And obviously, ACW had Paul Heyman's lead and obviously WWE, you know, where the pecking order was. Like every interview I've heard, WCW locker room was just chaos. No one knew what they was doing besides Hogan. Was it really that bad backstage? Um, yeah, I, I was there when it started to turn a little bit. I was still, I was there. I was only there for like four months at the time. Yeah. Um, but when I was there, people were happy because these were guaranteed deals. Turner was paying a lot of guys like they were the athletes on the, you know, Braves and stuff like that. Yeah. So, the, you know, the television stars was the way, wrestlers should kind of always have gotten paid, <laughs> but, but I, I didn't get a chance to see when it became basically, you know, free flowing money and dish off doing what he's doing and everybody doing whatever they want to do and matches changing throughout the night. That happened a couple of times, but remember in ECW, it kind of happened that way too. If Paul needed a match, if Paul, something happened and you needed to 
reverse the entire angle, we'd go right back out there and do it. And we weren't rehearsing matches for ECW like, like they do today where, you know, <laughs> we're whipping each other and reversing whips in the hallway and bouncing off the, <laughs> you ever see that right now? You're bouncing oh, off yeah. the air and duck and do that. No, we never, we never did that, man. We just had fun and figured it out. Almost I wasn't smart enough to know that you needed to call spots in the ring. That was really? the cool part about being young. Okay, this is kind of the way it is. Yeah. I was taught by Raven and even Tommy, Memphis, Portland, yeah. Yeah. Stampede, the places where Renee learned from, you know, his family. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, just get in the ring and call it. Like, and if you That's never, it. if you went from calling it and then having, or not calling it, rehearsing it, and then calling it, that's terrifying. But if you're yes. Renee starting in his mid teens and me at 19 going, okay, get in the ring and just call it. Okay. I don't, I don't even know any different. Fine. Great well, way that's to the thing, dude, I worked with Undertaker one time. Right. And mm-hmm. he was with, with John. He was like, and I went up to him cause you know, he was like, I call my stuff in the ring kid. And I was like, Oh, okay. I'll, I'm all ears. And, but then they were like, what was this kid think he is? Was like, no, my first five or 600 matches were called in the ring. That's yeah. how I learned. You know? Isn't it funny that like you go up humble and he says, I'll call it on the ring and you answer, okay, I'm all ears, whatever you want to do. And they're like, yeah. the most, most respectful thing you can say. And it's like, who right. is he? like he is. Yeah. yeah. yeah I know. And then you get, oh, fuck. Well, anyway, I don't want Dave to. Mother Teresa from a, from a, a blazing fire in the temple. And they'll be like, this kid thinks he can fucking save people. Who is he? <laughs> who is he to save Mother Teresa? <laughs> Right. <laughs> oh shit! What a great analogy. Wow. So, uh, do you want to talk about? Uh, let me ask you one question. You know, we're talking about producers stuff. Who did you connect with the most of all the producers? I got um, a positive note. You know. You know what's funny is it probably be Arn, which may be why that that particular statement hurt. And, and right. Sergeant Slaughter was another one. Yeah, I'd have to say the only one. The only one I didn't appreciate, and we all know, Renee, I was in a spot. I was putting guys over, yeah. but you've been in the business long enough. You've been on both sides of it like I have. And when an agent goes or a producer goes up to the talent that's putting the other talent over, you ask them if they, can you do this for us? Can you, you ask them, hey, we appreciate it if you can put this guy over. Is he, and you kind of give them the option at my point like, what would you like to do for a finish? I, you know, and obviously you'd say, hey, whatever you want to do, I'll take his finish straight up, no big deal. That's the way an agent politically and, and respectfully in a real way, you know, appreciates and keeps the underneath talent from having low morale to feel like right. you're appreciated and you count. Sergeant Slaughter would do that. Arn would do that. Um, the only guy that never did that, and I called him out once, was Dean Malenko. Well, did you have an experience uh, like that too? I mentioned a couple of times, Malenko. <laughs> Go watch my archive videos, dude. So what happened is, so it, it wasn't just me. And that's, that's sad because then that's, a, that, you know, that's his method, which is not the method of a producer. Producer's supposed to coach up both sides of the talent to make them play their part to the best they can. It's almost like you're, you're trying to massage both talents ego in a way to make everybody happy. Um, right. Dean came up to me one time, it was myself and Val, which honestly, <clears throat> myself and Val were even par. So it would be in my interest to ask who's going over because Val and I were both getting chopped out of the side. <laughs> you know, I mean, this could be like headbutt on the lockup, double knockdown finish for all I knew. Right. right. But when I said to Dean, like he goes, Hey, you and Val, eight minutes, and he just turned around, went to walk away. And I'm sure that's the way he did it with you, right, Renee? Oh, and I said, where he just didn't give you the who's going over. He just said, hey, you, you know, eight minutes and walked away. And I said, well, Dean, who's going over? And he went, oh, really? I said, no. That's the, one, that's the one time where I said, Dean, I've, never, I've showed you nothing but respect since, you, since you've been an agent here. Why don't you just show me the respect as a fellow, like, wrestler? I go... Just tell me who's going over and what you need. Show right. me some kind of common fucking courtesy. Right. I go, that's right. disrespectful. No, buddy, I didn't mean it that way. And I'm, I'm sorry. He goes, we want Val up with, 
with the with the frog splash and i go i'm happy to do it Just yeah, please yeah. tell me don't yeah, assume yeah. that i'm i have no value here right i go right. val's got to beat somebody if i don't go to the ring he's not fucking beating anybody exactly man and he goes no no i don't mean anything by it stevie and that's cool he wasn't backing up he just didn't he the bubble the bubble and i, I would hope he's different in AEW, but that and i hold no ill will personally to anybody because i know what the wwe bubble does to people and when you're out of it renee and i can have a conversation laugh about it like old marine buddies and it's all good yeah 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 but that's the thing like You'd agree that it, you, you you and I can understand how when guys leave there, you know, it'd be all oh, they're bitter, all oh, they're jaded. Oh, well, go there and work there for multiple years and experience that bubble that you speak of. You can understand why. Not only the the mid cards or lower card, even that some of the top guys that leave there, you know, they made millions or whatever, still have that, right? You want to talk about guys that I feel like could never enjoy their top spot. It's almost more torturous to be in that position. Like Brett couldn't enjoy it. He was always looking over his shoulder. Everybody else was like, when you're up there, there's definitely the, they're sharpening up the knives. It's crazy. Um, but I will say this, that this is the, the, the experiences that I'm talking about. I, I don't look at it with bitterness. I don't look at it with negativity. Like I said earlier, it instills an awareness, a work ethic, a perspective and also now like what I, what I think is a lot of people in athletics and entertainment, which were meld of both. Mm. It's the most liberating and exciting and terrifying thing when you leave the bubble and you say, man, it's up to me now. Yeah. Or some people are like, Oh my God, shit. It's up to me now. Yeah. I can't have nobody. Either you can say it's up to me and I can make this, an amazing life and a career or a business or anything I want to do after this, or you can say, wow, I can't blame anybody else for any of this shit. Who do I get to blame now? And what do I get to do to still point the finger at other people? And we've seen both sides of that, right? We've Yo, seen some real brother. tragedies, Renee, where people continue to be in denial or blame others and never take accountability for their actions and never move past wrestling you know what I mean? I mean, I think guys like us want to try to transcend it as best as we can. It's great that we did it. It's cool. And we get opportunities because people remember us, yeah. but then we take the ball and we, we want to build something different. Well, I'm one of those guys that's, it's in my blood. I was born and raised in a wrestling, you know, in the wrestling business. So, I mean, it's like, it's like the mafia, right? You try to get away, but it pulls you back in. You know what I mean? It's just, for me, it's the ultimate, I don't know it's my life, right? But well, you're right. Once I left there, right, I made the decision to leave. The first night I got into the Corquin Hall in Tokyo, and I experienced that audience and the polite applause because there's you know they're so polite over there, dude. It's almost like I, it's almost like I came in my shorts. I was like, holy fuck, this is great. <laughs> well, it's the feeling you should have every night when you go out there and wrestle and have the opportunity to do with only like. God, how many fractions of a percent, percent of people get to do, You're you right. know? No, I, I, I'll say this, like, you know, it, the fact that you're still doing it and you're going over and you're testing yourself, you know, because you get older, the bumps don't get any easier and the recovery Brother. time only gets longer, right? Brother. So you going over there for four months and testing yourself and keeping yourself in the game has me not doubting for a second that you're going to make another run in the u.s because it needs people with consistency more than anything i think these kids today especially in aew uh, are not going to have long careers unfortunately there's too much too much what you're doing is a shoot style but it's still pretty safe what yeah. these kids are doing are doing very it's stunts that could kill you so it's, it's not, not gonna be fun so, so you still keep up with the current products, the AEWs and the WWEs a little bit? Most, mostly WWE because Russo, Ben, and myself review War Pro and SmackDown, but I'll catch AEW highlights once in a while. And if it's somebody I like, like who I've known from the indies, like Trent Barretta, when he broke his neck, I sent him a, I sent him a message because I'm just like, I, I, somebody's got to reach out to this guy and maybe say, hey, man, you're a hell of a talent. You look great. Please just don't. Don't keep traveling down this road. So yeah, that's how much I keep up with it, though. But but man, 
there's been a lot of broken necks and the big E. The, the oh, I saw guy. that. Yeah. yeah. What <clears throat> me and Rodney were talking about it uh, just um, through Messenger. Do you attest that to timing? It was a timing issue. Well, I, I'll use the analogy with uh, myself and Bradshaw. That okay. red yeah. column guy is shorter than Big E. He's green, and it's a, it's a gloss over spot that's not even could my camera might not even have caught it because it was to go home for the tag match. So right. it's just a gloss over for the actual finish. Right, but right. you look at Ridge Holland, who's green and has already, there's been some mishaps already. Right. He's doing a belly to belly on Big E, who's bigger than him, larger and taller, just being taller, pops his hips. I don't think there's enough clearance logistically to get Big E over. So do you put the blame on the producer? I always put the blame on the producer when something unnecessary happens. Right. I always put the blame on, and you know what? You can't say that there's a mixture of rumors that the guys go in the business for themselves and do whatever they want. And then why do you have producers? But then everything, is, when you were there, everything is written down, earpiece, all that stuff, which God, I, I couldn't do that anymore. I never yeah. did it. I got heat for it. I can't do the waiting for the ref to tell me what to do next. Well, you're not a, you're a ref. I'm a wrestler. I'll tell, I'll tell this younger guy what to do next and you follow. But yeah. long story short with that, this is, this is where the blame is being like doing this. All right. It's the producer's fault. Well, they do whatever they want, but you just wrote everything out for Kevin Dunn. So you right. knew what was going to happen. You didn't stop it. Okay. Then you should be out of a job because yeah. a guy broke his neck. With he, that being said, Stevie, I remember hearing you in an other interview where you talked about that. Was it with, was it with Jamie Noble? Something happened in the ring and then you got blamed for it. And then. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, you know why he's still there now. <laughs> <laughs> you want to tell a story again or. It was, I think it was England. And um, once again, Jamie had to keep his job or do whatever, but I think it was completely unnecessary. Jamie. Um, Jamie told me to do something and it was kind of outside of what they were. This is when we were going from, Hey guys, give me seven minutes and give me a couple of things, but don't give me move for move. This is where they were going into move for move, write it on a piece of paper. And Jamie, and I forget, I try to put these, I don't really remember, you know, I, I remember stuff, but I try not to kind of like remember it too much for yeah. too long. Jamie uh, pulled me aside. He, oh, it was his first time agent, you know, first or second time agent. And he okay. goes, guys, you got to go out there and I don't want to get any heat and, you know, just do whatever they got to do. As a matter of fact, it was what they wanted for the match. Okay. And it was the exact thing. And I said, don't worry, we won't go off with anything. And Jamie goes, why don't you throw this, this, and this in there? So he came up with a couple of things. Right. I thought would have made him look good for the office. And then he could take credit, the whole deal. So, because if you get heat with the agents, they'll be the first ones to always bury you and say you have shitty matches on the road, house shows, and then you're off the road and you're not making money. So I did exactly what Jamie told me to do with the two kind of wild card type spots or ideas put in there. Yeah. Vince hated. It. And then Gorilla, Vince was like, what the fuck was that? Whose idea was that? And, and Jamie did the old Johnny Ace. I don't know what the hell. I don't know what they were doing. John, Stevie, what the fuck? You know, yeah. which usually Johnny has half a smirk. You know what I mean? To know that like, <laughs> you know, like ever see any winks that you like just play along kind right. of thing. But right. Jamie seriously threw, it was London, England. He threw me under the bus with it. And I was like, I think it was me and Shelton. The match was on, the match was on YouTube and it was a really good match. Yeah. But it was just something to where I just looked at him and I was just like, I didn't say anything because it's naturally like, why are we going to get into this right yeah. here? We're both going to, I'm just going to walk off, take the heat. And it, it, to me, I think there was probably just my guess, because I never experienced it. But my guess was that there were times with Jamie throughout the years where that's what secured his job doing those kinds of things. Would you agree you with that assessment? Right? That's where that's, that's like, that's a prime example of how it's a cutthroat business. But you know what it did? 
I'll tell you what those things did to all those experiences. I go back to it and I'm not trying to sound cliche positive about it, but nobody now can work me unless I let them work me. Nobody can put me in a position I don't want to be in unless I choose to be in that position. So I have nobody to blame for myself, even wrestling. We have nobody to blame but ourselves to allow to be treated that way. But we were in the bubble and we just wanted to make our name. Uh, but now in my current life, I don't have to associate. I don't have to put up with. I don't have to be around people I don't want to be around. I don't have to spend one second with people I don't love or care about. People I, you know, and I consider you one of those people, Renee. We were never outwardly close as friends throughout the locker room, but we always gravitated to each other and always felt like we were we were friends in that in that we were always looking over our backs so we can never foster the friendship because we're like, Shit, you look that way, I'll look that way. But um, and also here's a, something I've never talked about on any show outside of Russo. Uh, it's actually prepared me for the the carny world of politics, which I've considered off and on, not on a federal level or a state level, but on a local level to really serve my community and do things like that. I've, I've heavily, now that we're in Florida and we're the place where my wife and I love to live, uh, I'm considering it in the next Brother, year. Matt Morgan. Matt Morgan was- I'm a team. I talk to Matt all the time. I talk to okay. Matt all the time. Incredibly intelligent guy. And uh, he did very well. My only requirement is the fact that I don't want to dress like Matt. I want to. I want to be. Mayor. I want to be mayor. I want to be mayor of a beach town and wear, wear, wear like a polo and shorts and sandals and be the dude. Like my commission, my my like like assembly meetings will be walking down A one A on the beach. Right. <laughs> As we right. do it, everybody's got to go to the gym. That's my that's my mandate. So I'll put the gavel down on that. There you go. So James, you got it. Yeah. You got any questions just to finish it off? Uh, yeah, uh, just before we sign off, Stevie, uh, your fitness brand, I've checked out some of your stuff and it's great work what you're doing. And I've been trying to follow some of the tips on my uh, weight loss journey. Uh, tell me and Renee and everyone else how that came about, your fitness uh, brand and everyone the, where they can find it. Sure. You know, what's funny is it started and how it, how it grew. It's, it's kind of a long story, so bear with me. But... <laughs> Renee knows more than anybody, the access in the early 2000s, especially like 24 hour gyms were not a thing. Hotel mm -hmm. gyms that were worth anything were not a thing. We don't mm -hmm. live, we didn't live in that era. We lived in the era where GPS was just barely coming into fruition. We still used the maps to find and go to the biggest building and find the building from there. So okay. gyms too were really at a, at a rare premium. So a lot of times, and Renee knows about injuries. So a mixture of access and a lot of joint injuries forced me to work out with resistance band bands a great deal. Cause I would see Renee and everybody pumping up with them, but I'm like back in the early 2000s, like this is the only time I don't feel pain. I can do cardio, but let me use the bands because I can stay lean. I'm never going to be as big as most of these guys anyway. And I was literally doing my program in early 2000s, but had no clue. And that's the way life works sometimes. Right, so right. then I created the resistance band programs as I, as I got more technology profi proficient, because I started out as a tech channel on YouTube and I got to know how I a video edited and audio edited and, and fell in love with technology because technology, fitness and wrestling all have three, one thing in common. They're always evolving. They're always changing. And you can be so creative with all three and never get bored of them. That's why there's still all three passions to me. So when I got proficient at that, I said, well, wait a minute, I can save money. I can build the website. I can make the PDFs and make them interactive. I can edit the videos and create them and they can be a business to be fostered. Um, nobody bought my programs the first year. One person bought it the second year. And I, I, I know it's somebody that knew me and felt sorry for me. <laughs> you know? And if Renee, if Renee knew, it would be two people who felt sorry for me. But, but it worked. And I knew it worked because I've been doing it for like, at the time, like 16 years. And um, then from there, my wife had said to me, because I was trying to be the bodybuilder. I was trying to create all these different programs. And my wife literally said, what's wrong with just being the resistance band guy? Just being the band guy. And I said, that's true. Like, I'm like, just like I identified as a character, I have to identify as 
attached to a certain product, which is really low cost, easy. If they break, I, I partner with a company, Dynapro, that has lifetime warranty on the bands, which is great. It's right in line with me wanting to take care of people and help people and make sure that they have value for as long as possible. So okay. from there, the funny part was that even before the pandemic, I was like, you know what? And, and you know, Renee knows people scare me in general and I'm an introvert and I don't like to be around people. I, I can have conversations, but I also, we got into wrestling, I think, because we wanted to make pretend we were somebody else. So at our core, we're very shy and introverted. So I was like, man, I'm going to build a home gym. I always wanted to have a gym like Mark Mero or Hogan, these fancy gyms. So I built something, but I started reaching out to these companies that sold home gym equipment. And I started to communicate with them about what I could hopefully do for them. And I said, I'm in an apartment. It's not the easiest thing. We're going to turn the entire apartment into a home gym. It's going to be a cool concept. And companies started to send me product. And this company, Force USA, was the first one to do it. And Renato, how, how I can be loyal to, to people that are loyal to me. So they were, they were, they took a chance, they sent it to me, and I made I made the review on their first product, the MyRack. And then we fostered a relationship over a year or two. And then another company, Diamondback Fitness, which is the cardio home gym kind of like products, they started sending me some stuff to, to do. And then Renee knows by how I feel about cardio too. So it's brother. Kind of fun. Quite the Go test of the cardio product. machine. <laughs> so they, you know, I can test that. I'm, I'm a stress tester in a way. But yeah. um, the long story short, my band programs was our gateway to people that want to buy the home gym equipment. And, and, that, and those relationships fostered an affiliate relationship with those two companies and a few others. And then I became just what I am anyway. Just somebody, hey, it gives me my opinion. I'm just a guy who has a home gym and I like this stuff and it's cool. And I'm going to be as detailed as possible because everybody else was doing these fancy, like, you know, like cinematic, like freeze frame, slow-mo six to seven minute videos. And I said, well, this didn't tell me anything for me to spend five grand on, on a, on a functional trainer. I'm going to do a 20 and 30 minute review from delivery assembly in the, the, the each step of everything. And I'm going to do a one month, three month, six month, one year, two year review. So people can get the value that I'm not just like, all right, throw that out next and actually I'm using this stuff. So um, I think the authenticity and me just being who I am, which wrestling didn't allow guys like Renee and myself to really truly like project who we really are to see if the fans would connect. And that's, that's the opportunity I have with this YouTube channel and with now starting to, you know, podcast and do these things and try to get the word out. And my own shyness is even with this, I'm like, Oh my God, I hope it goes well. And I, I don't have to sound like an idiot. It's our natural fear, but, um, but I'm very blessed to be able to, cause every morning when I wake up that same exciting, terrifying feeling that it's all up to me, it's all up to me and I got to make it work and I got to learn how to market emails. And I got to see if I can do a giveaway and I got to, I got to see what other valuable content or information sources I can put out there. And now it's kind of cool because it's like, yeah, Stevie's Stevie used to be a wrestler, but now he's that fitness guy and he's that home gym guy. And yeah, he's got this equipment. He's got a YouTube channel. It's starting to finally kind of break through to that, to that part of my life. That's, that's really cool. So there's hope out there for everybody and then I give Renee all the credit in the world because he's doing the, the, path, the path less traveled by most wrestlers to try to just, I'm going to keep, this is in my blood. I recognize who I am and what I am. And I'm going to throw everything I can into it. Not one foot in, one foot out. Because if you're one foot in and one foot out, you're going to get hurt. So I, I commend you on that, dude. You're doing it the right way. Wow. Thank you. Thank I can't take you. a compliment, so that's why I threw it to him. See? <laughs> him. Well, I'm going to give you a compliment, Stevie. I just want to thank you so much for coming on. And from day one, when I was just a little kid looking for a job, you were always super cool to me. When I did that tryout camp, you were super cool to me. And uh, you're just a great human being all around. And I'm, like I said, getting in the ring with you, I knew I wasn't going to, I was, I was going to walk back to the locker room, not being stretched out. So I thank you for that as well. 
No so uh, He's thanking me for not stretching them. Look at that. <laughs> I think, I think, I think the thing that happens is this is a, this is actually a wonderful, beautiful thing because when you mentioned that my, and I know this has already happened with you, but my hope and my prayer is that another wrestler is listening to this and a younger wrestler and decides to do what I know you're doing. When you go over to Noah and these other places, you're remembering the way that I treated you and you're making sure that you pay that forward to treat the younger talent the same way. And that's how, that's how we change the business. You're right. You're right. Yeah. Right. No, I treat you the change, young That's how you change the business. Cause I'm retired after I heard about Noah's shoot style, I'm done. <laughs> no, I treat, I treat the young boys with the same amount of respect as the, as the seniors, man. You know, always cool. cool. Please yeah. be safe over there, man. Four months is no joke. Be safe make a ton of money and come back and take both of these companies for every penny they have to fucking <laughs> get them. Oh, get them. Well, is there anything you want to, you want to plug before we uh, let you go there? Sure. I had Stevie Richards, fitness.com is the main site. You can check out all the recommended brands we talked about as well as the resistance fan programs. Remember all the programs are digital. They have lifetime access. So once you buy it two years from now, and we just got an email today, two years from now, if you lose it, your computer breaks, you upgrade your phone, you don't have the PDF, shoot me an email with your order number, and I, I send you the link again. So you have true lifetime access. Uh, the YouTube channel right now is the main part of where I do all my main content, but I'm definitely going to do an actual show. I think there needs to be more positivity and more positive information and people that want to teach and help people out there. And you guys are part of what just motivated me to put me over the top to do that. So I have a video podcast live that goes on YouTube as well as the audio. So check that out. And we have an email newsletter coming out too. So if you go to awesome. stevierichardsfitness.com, you'll see all that stuff. I'll be sure to put all the links in the description for this video. Please do me a favor. Send me an email uh, if you want, and I'll send you our 12-week program so you can try it out. Oh, thank you. Oh, there you go. All right, my friend. Hey, you don't need it. It's a little too. Uh, I gotta. I gotta. You should sell an advanced program. I'll sell the beginner. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that'll be my next step. My next. My next uh, project. Well, Steve, thank you again, and maybe somewhere in a couple few months we'll have you back and uh, catch up. Okay. Absolutely, I'd love to talk to you guys again. I had a great time. Awesome, buddy. Take care, my friend. Take care. Bye bye.